just having a technical moment, so we'll get the PowerPoint up and running in a second. Um, but while I'm doing that, uh, I just want to welcome you to the session. Thank you for coming. This is Listen to the Lawyers. Um, my name is Lucy Freeman. I run an organization called MLDI. Uh, we provide legal defense to journalists. And I am uh, privileged and honored to be sharing a panel today with um, these fantastic lawyers who um, have experience from all over the world and are going to share some really practical advice today about some of the most common uh, legal threats and risks and considerations, um, and then also some of the things that you can do to um, try and protect yourself from them. While I get the PowerPoint up and running, I'm going to hand over and ask them to introduce themselves, which I know is, is a bit of a, a lazy panel of uh, coordinator thing to do. Um, and if you can speak into the microphone because we're doing this from here. Thank you, Lucy. Um, my name is Doreen Weisenhaus. I'm a senior lecturer um, and director of the Media Law and Policy Initiative at Northwestern University in Chicago. Uh, prior to that appointment two years ago, I uh, was at the University of Hong Kong for 15 years and will share some of the experiences that I have uh, from the Asia region uh, as well as applicability to some other parts of the world. Um, I've worked with um, Lucy and the Media Law um, Research uh, Initiative um, for many years since its inception. Um, and uh, look forward to uh, sharing some experience and comments. Um, prior to um, uh, working as an academic, um, I just want you to know that I was also a journalist uh, at the New York Times, uh, city editor and then legal and political editor. So I like to tell people that once a journalist, always a journalist. Um, uh, then went on um, and had a, a bit of a legal career as well. Um, anyway, I will hand the mic over. Hi, I'm Emmanuel Vargas. I'm Colombian. I'm a lawyer and also a journalist. I worked for eight years at the Foundation for Press Freedom in Colombia. It's an NGO dedicated to protection of journalists in, in that country. Um, I also worked for a couple of months uh, with the Colombian government. Not such a happy experience. and also with the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights in some issues re related with freedom of expression. Uh, since one month, one month ago, I started working at Media Legal, Legal Defense Initiative with Lucy as a Legal and Grants Officer. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Garina Arapova. I'm uh, a practicing media lawyer from Russia. Uh, I'm a director for the last 23 years. I'm a director of uh, an NGO called Mass Media Defense Center, which provides legal advice and defense to journalists uh, and media outlets and now bloggers practicing in Russia. Uh, I'm a practicing lawyer myself, uh, taking lots of cases on behalf of journalists and me uh, media outlets and on domestic level and to the European Court of Human Rights. I also um, conduct quite a lot of trainings on, on media law and how to uh, secure journalistic work um, on all stages uh, for journalists, uh, but also f on, me on different issues of media law for judges, lawyers, how to defend journalists. So it's quite interesting work, I have to say. Uh, teaching is also one of my um, area of engagement. I'm teaching in the university at the School of Journalism, uh, media law and internet law. Hi, I'm Alex Papachristou from the Vance Center in New York City. Uh, I, I, uh, I know a lot of journalists. I like journalists. I was married to a journalist once, uh, <laughs> but I'm not a journalist. Uh, I'm barely a lawyer, although uh, I am licensed to practice law in New York, uh, but that's a small place. Uh, and I'm, I'm come to you then with a lot of uh, humility and apology uh, for any uh, sense you have that I'm giving you legal advice. Uh, but. Uh, I, the Van Center, where I work, uh, does represent journalist organizations, so we do a lot of work with OCCRP and many of its network members. We do a lot of work with ICIJ. Uh, I'm on the board of ICIJ myself, uh, and we've worked with uh, solo journalists and large journalism organizations uh, 
always on a pro bono basis. Uh, that means, of course, that the journalists don't pay and they, and they get what they pay for, uh, as far as legal advice is concerned. I, I'm being a little bit uh, sarcastic about it because I want to introduce uh, right away, at least from my perspective, a note of, uh, of caution and hesitation as far as uh, the, the value that, that lawyers can give to journalists because as you know better than I, uh, when you're out there uh, on your own and even if you have a lawyer, you can't talk to your lawyer and, and your lawyer is going to tell you, well, don't do the thing that you want to do as a journalist or it's too late, you already did it or whatever. So you know, we'll, we'll try to be, all of us I think, practical and realistic uh, and recognize that the skepticism that journalists have for lawyers is probably well-founded, but nevertheless, we can from time to time be helpful. Is that okay, Lucy? Great, thank you. Um, so we've had um, a bit of a, a think about the, the main challenges that, that we see um, journalists facing when it comes to, to legal threats. Um, and we've been trying to organize it in a way that really goes through the process of the story and the investigation that you're doing. So getting the information, storing information, preparing it for publication, and then what happens when you publish. Um, so we're going to go through um, in a kind of uh, linear way. Um, we'll have time for discussions and questions at the end. Um, and if there are other areas or other burning legal concerns that you have that we haven't captured or mentioned, um, then please do ask about those. Um, unfortunately, there are a lot of legal risks, and we've just uh, focused on a few for this session, but we're very happy to, to broaden it afterwards. So I will hand over to Doreen to kick us off with number one, accessing information. Thank you, Lucy. Um, and it is true, there are so many issues that we could really hold um, a three-day, four-day, five-day conference. Can you hear me here? Yeah. Um, um, on the various legal e risks. Um, but we decided to focus on those that we were seeing more activity in, uh, more uh, trends in. Um, and so um, I'm kicking off the first session on um, accessing information. So often some of the typical uh, legal threats faced by journalists, as you all know, uh, occur after publication, um, when you've published something and then uh, you get the reaction that you either hope for or don't um, expect or don't want. Um, but I want to discuss some of the trends, legal and otherwise, um, and that's important uh, to know that sometimes there are things you can do to protect yourself legally that don't actually involve law per se, but safe practices um, in which you can try to prevent some of the legal risks that you might be facing. Um, so I want to focus on things that can impact or hinder journalists before publication when they're attempting to access information. So one common way you're all investigative journalists um, that you're all aware of is freedom of information laws and right uh, to information laws dealing with that. I won't be addressing that topic because there is an excellent session tomorrow um, morning at 1045, moderated by Kevin Goldberg, um, which will be a fabulous session because it will be focusing on FOIA trends worldwide and looking at practical cases um, with experts discussing their particular situations and what they did to overcome um, any uh, issues or legal problems. Um, and in particularly, there will be a representative of the International Consortium of investigative journalists, um, and which will talk about their project on the medical devices um, investigation. And so they'll share their tips and tricks and so on. So my comments will focus on two areas. Um, if you can see that, maybe they can turn the light down uh, right over the PowerPoint. Um, and that is on uh, protection of sources, uh, including risk to yourself as you handle sensitive information, particularly involving national security, official secrets, and so on, and in covering protests. Um, we've seen a big uptick um, in uh, issues and journalists um, encountering difficulties uh, in this particular subject area. Okay. So the first area on uh, protection of sources includes, um, um, as many of you are aware, that whistleblowers are particularly vulnerable these days. You can't go, hardly a, a week goes by without hearing some story or development about a whistleblower uh, getting into trouble. And so journalists need to be concerned about protecting those sources. Now, 
only a handful of countries around the world really have comprehensive whistleblower protections. Um, in the EU, for example, there's really only about uh, 10 countries. Uh, Germany, you're not one of them. Uh, but France, Hungary, Ireland, Italy, Lithuania, Malta, Netherlands, uh, Slovakia, Sweden, and the UK, although the UK is a special circumstance, which I'll talk about in a little bit. But there is some good news on the horizon. Um, last spring, uh, the EU issued a directive for comprehensive whistleblower um, uh, regulations. And so they're going to lay down new EU-wide um, standards to protect whistleblowers, uh, breaching um, and revealing breaches of EU law in a wide range of areas, including, um, and this is very exciting, public procurement, financial services, money laundering, product and transport safety, nuclear safety, public health, consumer and data protection, and yes, it even touches on national security. Um, so it's not in effect at this time um, because the different uh, countries have to institute and implement rules, which should take about at least two years, um, but that's some good news um, on the horizon. So be aware throughout the EU uh, what your country is doing and what um, uh, it's doing to uh, protect, because specific uh, in the directive is that journalists are covered uh, for um, protection for what they publish on the evidence that's given to them uh, by the whistleblowers. However, and this is the sad part of the story, um, is that in the absence of these protections, and particularly in the areas of national security, many media organizations and journalists have adopted um, uh, tech tools to protect themselves. If you don't have the laws, at least perhaps you might have uh, the technology to provide these protection, particularly to guarantee anonymity. Um, the New York Times, where I used to work, um, for example, has on its web website specific instructions uh, and calls for whistleblowers to, quote, provide evidence that this government represented is breaking the law. And they recommend tech tools, uh, such as WhatsApp and Signal, the encrypted messaging apps, and SecureDrop for documents. Um, how many of you here in this room use any of these uh, particular tools? Yay. So the, for the few of you who don't, um, there's also some wonderful digital uh, security uh, cafes and sessions um, and strongly advise for you to um, uh, uh, get up to speed on that. However, um, in the area of national security and official secrets, um, there's a development that happened uh, earlier this year involving the indictment in the US of WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange. Now, many of you might think, well, how does this impact journalists? Is he really a journalist? He's not really a journalist. He just uploaded all those documents. Him and Chelsea Manning um, you know, conspired to do X, Y, and Z. Um, I'm here to tell you that I think that this case, how it plays out, will have an impact. Because often what the law looks at is not so much necessarily your status as a journalist, but what were the activities that were done that constituted journalistic practices, okay? And so, and for that, uh, this particular case threatens to um, um, upend journalist efforts to entice uh, sources to provide confidential information. So just quickly, he was indicted uh, this past spring by a federal grand jury and charges of violating a very old law, a 1917 Espionage Act. Now one charge dealt with hacking, but the other charges were in that he was encouraging sources to uh, produce illegally obtained information. And we know that the laws in most countries don't protect hacking or specific instructions to hack. But where is that line between encouraging a source to get additional information? I mean, isn't that the bread and butter of what journalists do? You entice people to try to give you the information that you're looking for. Um, and so Jim Risen, uh, formerly of the New York Times and now of The Intercept, says, hey, that's what we do. Governments don't want to give us this information, and therefore, um, that's what our job is. Um, furthermore, this uh, particular prosecution um, has one additional act, and it's the first time they're uh, prosecuting someone for the mere publishing of um, 
uh, classified information, not anything else attached to that. So last week I was in London for the Media Law Resource Center, which is a trade group of US, UK, and EU lawyers who represent media and media organizations. And they were all talking about this case and trying to see where this might play out. Um, so, the, and here are some of the stories that they say. Okay, so you're using your encryption, you're using your secure drop and so on. What if this is being used as evidence against the journalists that this is a means of conspiracy? In other words, the mere fact that you're protecting um, the source by using these tech tools in specific cases involving national security, official secrets, so forth, Cases are now looking at this as evidence that you're trying to hide something. You're not doing something on the up and up. So what does this mean for these kind of cases? Well, Jim Risen again um, says, well, wait a second. Maybe we go back to the old fashioned way. We actually meet with sources over long periods of time so you get to know them. So it's not always going to be anonymous. Um, Jill Phillips, uh, who's uh, in-house counsel for The Guardian newspaper, we all remember the story that they broke a couple of years ago, Edward Snowden, um, says that uh, you need this opportunity um, to revise your tactics because the government today doesn't actually even need to use subpoenas to get at the sources of information because there's been massive increase in surveillance uh, against journalists and their sources, and so they have opportunities to get at this information. Um, so their practical advice, use virgin computers, uh, computers that have never uh, accessed the internet. Use burner phones, and don't leave a trail, uh, tech-wise or otherwise, um, that can hurt you or the case that you're working on. Um, and then, of course, many believe that Jamal Khashoggi, the Saudi Arabian writer for the Washington Post, uh, who was killed in the Turkish embassy, he thought his messages that he had on WhatsApp to another dissident uh, were probably safe. Uh, there's a lawsuit now by this dissident um, who was communicating with uh, Jamal uh, Khashoggi that um, there had been uh, Pegasus, uh, had been malware on his phone, and that the information was being provided to the Saudi Arabian government. Um, so something uh, that you need to be aware of. Um, then I'm sorry, I'm talking too long, probably. Um, so quickly here, um, uh, in the Reuters case, I'm sure you're familiar with uh, the two um, uh, Miramar journalists um, who were uh, charged, uh, detained um, in 2017 and convicted of obtaining and, um, hold and possessing official secrets. Um, in that particular case, they were working on a major investigation uh, trying to confirm a massacre of the Rohingya um, Muslim minorities who were being um, uh, persecuted and prosecuted by the um, Buddhist uh, majority, but in this case there was um, evidence that they procured of um, an execution. And in that case, um, before um, they went to uh, press on that, they were contacted by their police source, went to a restaurant. Um, as they finished their, their coffee and were walking out, the police source handed them a newspaper, a rolled up newspaper. They walked out the door and were immediately arrested because inside were some official documents that were um, state secrets. And so um, one of the things that we had talked for many years in China and Hong Kong where um, I was based is never have physical possession in your hands of a document that could be classified unless you are very, very, very sure of your sources, which goes back to uh, Jim Risen's advice, which is get to know your sources over a long, long period of time because these are issues. Um, Okay, um, so for protests, so the second area. Um, growing numbers of map protests around the world, I don't have to tell you here in Germany, um, there has been a, a massive increase in journalists uh, facing um, uh, violence by both police um, and by um, uh, the protesters. Um, I just came back from a visit to Hong Kong where there has been an increase in violence against journalists um, uh, because of this uh, massive protest that began um, as um, a rebellion by the locals against um, 
an extradition bill which would have allowed uh, Hong Kong individuals to go to be uh, sent back to China to face a very different kind of uh, criminal justice system that was available in Hong Kong, which is part of a one country, two system, and they still retain a UK Western style um, uh, legal system and uh, civil liberties. Um, but it's now expanded um, to be a fight for pro-democracy and so on. So journalists have been there front and center. You've seen the videos, you've seen the photographs of what they've been able to document. Well, they probably did too good a job. Um, because now the police are targeting them with um, in three areas. One, increased violence against journalists, uh, spraying them with pepper spray, directing tear gas toward them um, with obstruction, uh, keeping them away from the areas of where they're doing mass arrests, and then finally with harassment, uh, accusing them of being fake journalists, even though they might be wearing their yellow helmets and their vests, clearly identifying themselves, um, and then um, saying that that they're really working on behalf of, um, of the protesters. So in that case, the International Federation of Journalists, uh, which is a very good organization which can help document these uh, incidents of, of harassments and violence, and the Hong Kong Journalists Association are documenting these very specific cases. Um, and so what you want to do if you're involved in a protest, and I could go into details later, I know I'm, I'm, I'm going on a little long here, um, is, is be, be very specific. So you want to be able to document um, what incidents have happened involving you. Record the details of the incident, time, place, the specific action, ID of the police if you can, make sure you have video if you can, photographs, get witness statements, um, have your lawyer or someone take photographs of your injuries, um, insist on being taken um, to a hospital for a medical exam. All of these will be relevant if and when you do file a, an action before a police complaint board. Um, there's some complications in Hong Kong because the police no longer identify themselves. They have removed their ID badges. They wear all black now. They have the full riot gear on and the mask so you can't see them. That said, you can still try to get as much evidence as you can in that type of specificity. Um, okay, uh, and then quickly, uh, wherever you are covering protests, make sure you know your rights. Um, police uh, may not prevent uh, journalists from covering protests if they're in a place where the public is allowed. And this is fairly standard around the world, although you'll see specific things that we have other people talking about what's happened in Russia and in other places. And as long as you're not disrupting or interfering with law enforcement. Um, and that um, is kind of the, the uh, issue that um, Galena uh, will be talking about because there's some case law on that. Um, there are some laws forbidding photography, but not uh, much for as long as you're in public, and that includes uh, police officers on duty. Um, but if you're asked to leave, this is where some uh, problems can happen if you don't uh, end up leaving. Anyway, uh, one final thing, word of advice. Um, if you are arrested, be careful not to panic. Um, uh, not saying things that incriminate you, but of course, identify yourself clearly as a journalist, make sure that you know that. Um, and whatever you do, ask to make a phone call, but don't use your own personal phone to do that, because what happens? You open your phone, and then they will seize your phone and your other devices, and then will have access to that information. In most places, they need a warrant uh, in order to access your phone, so unless you um, open your phone for them, they won't be able to do that. Um, Galina, did you want to talk to us a little bit about what's happening in Russia and some of the case law in Europe? Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, I'll continue with the problem uh, of covering protests by journalists as we, we see that uh, the way of protest is growing uh, everywhere. In particular, in, in Russia lately, we have, we're facing quite um, uh, a storm of protests and uh, unfortunately, uh, journalists are uh, having problems with reporting from uh, this scene. And uh, it's not just uh, a problem of my country. Uh, Authorities are using um, power to uh, prevent journalists are, uh, to be on the spot and report from there. And that's uh, quite a universal tool to silence media from covering protests. So uh, uh, 
I'm I'm not going to tell you a lot about like Russian cases. I would like to underline a couple of issues that w uh, lawyers are um, uh, stressing now with regards to the European Court of Human Rights jurisprudence. Uh, with regards to covering protests by journalists and media. Um, maybe you've heard of a case of a Finnish journalist. Do we have Finnish journalists here? No? No one, okay. Uh, the guy is, uh, is called Markus Pentikainen, and uh, he was covering uh, a huge uh, protest uh, in Helsinki. Uh, it was a forum, e Europe, Asia, uh, or Asia Europe forum in Helsinki, and uh, it supposed to be a peaceful demonstration, but it turned into the violent uh, rally. And uh, police at some point uh, decided to stop demonstration and asked everyone to leave uh, the spot, the scene of uh, uh, what was, uh, where it was happening. And uh, uh, Marcus was reporting from uh, uh, demonstration what was happening, and then he had, uh, he was um, actually on, on his duty. He didn't have anything on him. He didn't wear any like clothing or badge uh, showing that he is a journalist. But when a police, uh, policeman asked him to identify himself, he uh, right away said that he is a journalist, he's working for a local newspaper, and he is here, he was here to make photographs and uh, report immediately after demonstration to local media and online. And he refused to leave the scene uh, to the end uh, of the event. Uh, that was considered by police as uh, a refusal to follow the lawful police, policeman order, and he was arrested, uh, detained for almost 18 hours, and then prosecuted. At end, that was a criminal prosecution. So he was found guilty by the court, but no uh, sanction was posed because he was uh, uh, excused by the court saying that, well, that was not like a serious um, offense. So even though he was convicted, he should not serve any additional um, sentence. Anyway, uh, the problem is that this particular case, and uh, media lawyers and journalists, when we, f we read this case, we understand that like, that like a quite a serious interference with the journalist's uh, uh, public role and uh, his watchdog role and his professional activity because he was uh, prevented from reporting from the demonstration and he was convicted for that and he was detained and sentenced uh, even though he was pardoned from any sentences but still you know it's not a pleasant thing to be uh, stigmatized as a, a criminal because he was bearing a conviction so uh, for some strange reason and uh, it's it's um, probably weird to say because I'm a, I myself a lawyer practicing in the European court and uh, this case was uh, highly criticized by all media lawyers so why I'm talking to you why I'm telling you about this case because you um, it, it would be great if you read this case and see the argumentation of the European court because it's it's like a detective story you, you can easily uh, follow the the logic of that uh, of that case uh, for some strange reason the European court uh, did not find violation of article 10 of the European Convention in this case article 10 of the European Convention is guard is uh, the freedom of expression um, article of the of the international treaty and uh, guarantees everyone uh, the right to freely express um, ideas uh, and uh, disseminate information. So that was no violation of Article 10. And uh, that decision was uh, supported by the Grand Chamber of the European Court. And Grand Chamber, that's like the biggest uh, assembly of uh, judges of the European Court, 17 of them. Uh, so this decision is really uh, a problem for media, media law and journalists. And we are trying, uh, like lawyers from different countries are trying to overcome this decision, uh, arguing that journalists should not be treated like that. Journalists should have the real possibility to report 
uh, from uh, any kind of um, public rallies, demonstrations and protests. They should not be arrested and taken away from the spot because that's actually what police sometimes is doing. Like in Russia, you know what they do. Uh, when there is a demonstration, police is just uh, identifying journalists by, you know, by any kind of like, if they have a badge or like a huge professional camera, they take them, put them in a car and give them a ride around the downtown for like a couple of hours. And, it's, and they don't arrest them. They release them like uh, in, in a little while and drop them on the other side of a city. And just so they would not have a possibility to, to take pictures and report. And it's very difficult to argue that and challenge that in the court because they haven't done anything. They just, uh, you know, took you, put you in the car and lovely give you a ride around the city. That's what they do. Of course, sometimes they, uh, they don't give a ride. They just put you in a corner of uh, like a, in a, on that end, uh, uh, dead end street and don't give you a possibility to freely walk out of this corner and uh, do your own business. That, uh, that's another possibility. Uh, that's another tool what, they do, what authorities do. Sometimes they uh, take journalists to, as, as well as protesters to the police station, uh, check their identity, and it doesn't matter whether a journalist is presenting their press card right there. They just say, okay, they we'll just talk to you later in the police, uh, uh, um, uh, of a police office. So they take them away from the scene anyway. So this is like a tricky thing the police is doing. And of course, uh, above all that, journalists are being arrested, convicted, uh, fined, detained, and serve uh, administrative arrests. In Russia, there is no um, criminal charges for journalists. We don't have cases of criminal judges, uh, charges for journalists for uh, covering protests, but a lot of um, uh, cases where they've been charged with administrative fines and administ administ administrative arrest for a number of days. So th these things, these instruments are used by uh, many authorities in many jurisdictions. So they don't want all that to be covered, pictured and reported. Uh, so Unfortunately, Pentecanon case doesn't help us, us with that. And we are, and human rights NGOs working in the field of freedom of expression who are helping media, we are raising uh, this problem uh, on the international level and again, and bring this again to European court, uh, trying to argue Pentecanon case saying that uh, it's actually not helping journalists. It uh, creates uh, additional obstacles for uh, them to perform their profession, their, pro their function. Um, one serious issue with regards to this case is uh, that uh, European court m marked that journalists did not have any identification uh, clothing or badge or anything. He didn't wear anything that would identify him in a crowd. And uh, we are actually trying to um, uh, underline for European Court and for, con for Council of Europe, the problem is th uh, that it's not uh, safe in uh, many cases, in many contests, uh, contexts, and in many countries for journalists to ident identify themselves. Sometimes if they, if they wear a special vest or a badge, they would be a, a first uh, target for the police. So we are advising journalists not to wear anything like that. But if they are asked by police, they have to present their press card right away. Another, e another issue which uh, is coming out of this situation, what if you are not a member of staff of the media outlet and you are a freelancer or a blogger or activist, because sometimes these people are actually performing journalistic function a lot more than journalists who are officially working for state media. Like in Russia, uh, state media journalists are not actually uh, journalists anymore in many cases. Uh, they, they are working more like a propaganda kind of uh, like officers. So, uh, but journalists are, who are working, like, or activists who are working uh, for independent media, sometimes they are not affiliated to particular registered media because that is 
uh, that becomes dangerous by itself, the registration. So that has to be taken into account, but in different jurisdictions that works differently. Uh, so uh, just bear this in mind, and uh, I would really highly advise you to uh, have a look how uh, this is um, regulated on your domestic level, and uh, if you are working in the countries that are under jurisdiction of the European Court, have a look at the Pentecanon case, and also uh, the more recent Pentecanon is 2015 um, case. And um, I can spell you on... on um, yeah, uh, it's, it's actually yeah. spelled. And uh, uh, another case which is more recent uh, is Butkevich. Butkevich versus Russia, which is much better. So they found violation of Article 10, and they actually dis uh, made distinction between Pentikainen and Butkevich. And Butkevich is a Ukrainian journalist who was reporting f from the demonstrations and uh, demonstration in Russia, and he was arrested, uh, uh, was uh, fined, um, and detained under administrative code. So that that's a better case that gives us hope that actual journalists would be supported on an international level uh, while they're covering protests. And it's clear that um, it's not just a legal issue. It would be great if the media community, journalists themselves, would raise their voice and try to fight for their, their right to cover protests because that's it's essential, not just to perform a watchdog role, but also for the public, because how I would know, uh, as a like a regular citizen, what is happening in Moscow if I'm not there. I want, I would like to see what is happening, and I can only have uh, a chance to see that if a journalist is reporting that. So, that would be uh, probably like the, the most practical advice uh, to go into these two couple of cases because there are many of uh, things published on this but these two would give you understanding of what you can use as a legal argument to um, defend yourself in this situation. Thank you Galina and I'm going to ask Emmanuel very quickly to come in from the Americas um, perspective on protest. Yeah, um, well in Latin America uh, the last years have um, faced many uh, protests in almost every country. Maybe the most difficult ones have been in Nicaragua, or, but also in Venezuela, and Argentina, and Colombia. And what happens in most of the cases is that the risk is not only coming from uh, the police or the military, but also from um, the demonstrators. Demonstrators are sometimes uh, those who are attacking journalists while doing uh, coverage of a, of a protest. Um, in, in Latin America, we have a, a similar court to the, to, the inter to the European Court of Human Rights, it's the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, and they dis decided a case in 2012 which was much more uh, uh, favorable for freedom of expression, and it's actually quite similar to the Pentecanin case. Um, this case is about uh, a protest that happened in Colombia, is Vélez Restrepo versus Colombia. Uh, Luis Gonzalo Vélez Restrepo was a journalist uh, that, who in 1996 was covering a protest in the Amazonian area of Colombia, and uh, while doing so, he noticed that the uh, military were beating uh, demonstrators. And when he was filming that, the uh, militaries noticed that and started uh, attacking him and asking him to uh, give them his camera. Um, they broke his camera, but they didn't break the cassette. Uh, and he could keep it, uh, but had to leave to the hospital and actually had to leave Colombia because he was forced into exile because of uh, threats received uh, by the military. Um, the Inter-American Court said three relevant things regarding this case. First, that there was an evidence uh, showing that the military were attacking him in order to obstruct his work. Uh, this cassette was showing evidence of uh, the attack and actually had uh, the voices of the military saying, give me the cassette. Yeah. Uh, 
the second thing that was relevant for this case was that the Inter-American Court showed that the, the um, journalists have a relevant role for democracy and that when they are covering a protest, they are actually given a guarantee of showing that things are going well or wrong. Uh, they, they can uh, give you the picture of whether the protest was performed in a in a legal way, in a peaceful manner, or that uh, the authorities acted unlawfully, or that the demonstrators actually acted unlawfully. And um, the third thing that the that the court said was the um, that the journalist was identified as a journalist, and uh, because of that, he uh, had a special protection uh, granted by the law, uh, granted by the Inter-American Convention of Human Rights. Uh, these three cases, these three uh, factors are relevant for what a journalist has to do while covering a protest. And I think that is, this is something that I will recall in this and in other subjects, and it is to do a risk assessment before starting a, any any process, and this risk assessment includes uh, risks uh, to your body, but also legal risks that you may face uh, during the coverage. And um, in order to do so, you have to also look at the context. Is this a case where being identified as a journalist uh, will be favorable for me, or is this a case where um, distance from from myself? Uh, and from the protesters will be useful for me. So what matters the most is that you can distinguish yourself and that the, you can show that you are not part of the demonstration or that you're in favor of any of the parties involved. Um, and also, a relevant thing is that you are able to, to, to activate your network. You have to have a network of people surrounding you before you go to the protest. You have to have your editor knowing that you will be there. You have to have a lawyer, a friend, someone who knows that you are going to a place that you will, uh, where you will probably face uh, a danger. And in this kind of cases, it's also relevant to tell them in which time do you think that you can be able to contact back. You know, if if and if you don't come back at that time, they will probably know that something is going wrong. Yeah, and those are the cases in which they will probably have to go and look at the police station uh, if you are there, and or look to uh, the hospitals or things like that. Thank you. Okay, so assuming you've been to the protest, you survived it, you've got the information. Um, Alex, could you tell us a bit about how to handle the information once you have it? Sure. Uh, Although the line between having the information, um, getting the information and having it is, is obviously a blurry one because you have to, when you have it, you have to use it. And how you use it can involve you in uh, issues of, of getting that information in the first place. You, you have to confirm the information you have, and that means going back to the original source or to another source. Uh, you're, uh, you're going to write about that information. Uh, you're going to maybe publish it in some way itself. And, and so it's, it's not just that you're holding on to this information uh, and, and not doing anything with it. That's, I think, something to note. Um, when we talk about the information, let's, let's uh, identify the types of information. So you have uh, something that somebody told you, you wrote it down, right? You have uh, an image that you or somebody took uh, of a person or a, an event or something like that. Uh, you have a document that somebody gave you. Uh, I think it's useful to specify. Is there any other form of information that I haven't said? An image, uh, an interview, a document. Uh, and then uh, we can also, did I miss something? No, I probably did. Anyway, think of it later. Then the, the, the information can have uh, a, a form or a quality that is distinctive and therefore will have some relevance. So uh, it could be that the information is classified, is considered to be a government secret. 
It's, so it, it, it can, and that can be even words that a person told you. A person will tell you something that she's not supposed to tell you, and it, because it's a, a government secret, you now have that information. It's still a government secret in many people's understanding, especially government people's understanding, that you know, it, it remains a secret, secret information. Obviously, a document can be marked top secret, confidential. You have that document, uh, and, and it has this quality. Uh, it also could be considered uh, privileged. So it, uh, in the uh, Paradise Papers case, uh, Appleby, the law firm that got hacked, uh, whose uh, data got then uh, published by various people, uh, claimed that, in the case that against The Guardian, that the information that had been hacked was privileged because it involved communications between lawyers and clients. And therefore, even though a journalist might have the right uh, to publish it under some notion of the public interest, uh, there was also consideration that it should be kept secret because it was an attorney-client communication. So a privilege is a quality that information can have uh, that may affect uh, your legal right to use it. Um, there's also uh, corporate secrets. So a company can say, well, that information which you journalists got is our uh, commercial secret information. And you cannot publish that because you'll be violating our commercial interests. Obviously, also, there's uh, similar protections through copyright. Uh, and and, and we, we've seen some cases of that maybe you have as well, where uh, somebody claims that the information you're using or publishing is subject to copyright and you can't use it without permission. That often happens with images now. Uh, somebody will, will claim that that image belongs to, to him and that you, for, you can't publish that image, use that image in your story uh, because you don't have the right to it. He has the right to it. So those are the qualities that information can have that will have relevance to how you can use them and obviously how you can, how you can keep them. Uh, and uh, we mentioned the intercept. It had the unfortunate uh, occurrence of uh, providing uh, an image of the document that a source had leaked uh, to the government for comment. And the government was able, this is in the United States, to tell from the image of the document where that document had been printed and at, and at what time, and therefore could figure out who had done it, and that person who was the source is in prison for 25 years or something. So you know, the journalist there was having to use the document. As they say, you have to get confirmation that it's really a government document. How do you do that in a way that doesn't get your source in trouble or you in trouble? Uh, then uh, we, we have, now if we talk about cases uh, to be you know, specific about a few that we've seen, uh, journalists uh, getting called to the police and told to produce their devices because the journalists have reported on stories and the police want to know who are the sources of the stories. Now the, journal the police may be work operating in good faith. Uh, they may want you to open your phone, uh, you know, and then they may want to try to compel Apple to tell them how to open the phone, and Apple says, no, they won't do that. Uh, you, as the journalist, uh, don't want to do that either. The police confiscate it. Uh, we, cases in uh, Ukraine, West Africa, uh, Eastern Europe, where the police have said, we're, we're just going to take your devices and keep them, and you don't get them back. Or if you don't open your devices and show us the information in there, we're going to put you in, in jail and keep you there until you open the devices. So uh, you know, having uh, the information in a form that is subject to police uh, or other uh, seizure uh, creates a, a legal risk. So uh, what form do you keep the information in? It could be, it could be uh, a stick you know, that has the data in it. It could be a phone, it could be a tablet, a laptop, uh, you know, or it could be a, a piece of paper. 
uh, or it could be your notes, it could be your memory. You know, you, you spoke to somebody and you remember who that person is and that's the, the, the form that the information is taking uh, that people may want to get. And it's not obviously just the police. Uh, it is, uh, you, you have cases of, of companies suing journalists to not only to block information from being published, but to get that information back, claiming that's our information. Somebody took it from us. It wasn't you. We understand that somebody gave it to you, but it's our information, and you need to give it back to us. Uh, and uh, then you have to face the specific issues in the jurisdiction where you work, where you publish. Uh, do I, as a journalist, have a right to publish this even though it's stolen um, because I'm pursuing the public interest or because there's a journalist privilege or whatever the, the, the terminology might be in, in each country. Uh, so another case uh, with regard to copyright, uh, a, a client of mine wanted to publish with a story an image from the Facebook page of the subject of the story. And that uh, person complained to uh, the host of the uh, journalists' organization's website, saying that it, it had to take down that image because that image was in violation of, of the copyright that the person claimed he had uh, for his Facebook uh, page. Now, in, in, in the United States where this took place, that wasn't such a big problem, but again, it, for me, it raises for you the legal issue of uh, what form it is that the information takes and what right do you have to, to maintain it in that form or in some other form. Finally, what can you do, uh, practically speaking, to protect yourself when you have information that you know is uh, classified or privileged or uh, uh, subject to some... Uh, corporate secrecy, uh, how, can you, how can you maintain it? What, what practical steps can you take? So, to some, as others said, this is not just you alone against the government or the world. It's you and whatever publisher you're working with. Even if you're a freelancer, you're presumably working uh, from time to time with different publishers. Uh, now you, you don't like to share your sources even with your editors necessarily, but when you have information that you know is very sensitive, better that be the publisher's information than your information only. Uh, maybe that means that the phone you're using or the computer you're using isn't yours. Whatever device it is that has this information belongs to the publisher. And so you can say to, to the police or the court, I don't have the right to open that. It's not mine. It doesn't belong to me. I'm only using it because the company gave it to me, and you have to go to the company. Anything that de delays and disperses the attempt to get that information from you can be legally and also practically helpful. Uh, you may consider uh, sharing that information with a lawyer, have, hiring that lawyer to represent you because you're concerned that having this information could put you in legal jeopardy, and the lawyer may be willing to keep that information for you. And the, the, wherever you are, the laws may protect lawyers more than they protect journalists as far as having information of a, of a, of a nature that is uh, risky to you uh, more protected. So you know, the, the lawyer can say, I have this information, yes, but it's subject to the attorney-client privilege. And in some places, that might be stronger than whatever journalistic privilege there might be. So uh, you, you may consider that. Uh, I don't think you want to consider giving it to a friend. Uh, that, does, that just gets the friend in trouble. We see those cases. Uh, and, uh, um, you know, and I, on, that, on that point, I just want to make another point about how you get information, because I've just, in the last few days, given advice on this. Um, you know, can you uh, legally, forget about ethically, uh, hide your identity or, or uh, create a false identity to get information. Uh, can you, for example, open a, 
a, a Twitter account or a Facebook page in a, in a fake name. Obviously, that may violate Facebook's policies. I could care less about that, frankly. Um, but the question is, does it, does it put you at some legal risk, and does it compromise the nature of the information you have? Does it mean that using that information will be more difficult for you? Uh, and I, I think that's something to take very seriously. You know, I, I know there's a whole uh, thing about going undercover and, and f or filming with a hidden camera and all of that. Um, I think one has to take precautions ahead of time about legal risks that may arise from your uh, obtaining information in a way that's not necessarily legal, uh, even if uh, you know you you uh, you know having that information itself is is okay. All right. Yeah, that's okay. great. Anything else? No? <laughs> as far as uh, assuming fake profile, well. I, I, my own advice, just as a completely general proposition, because it's going to vary from place to place, is that you shouldn't do it if you can possibly avoid it, because uh, it, it will just make your life really, really complicated. I had a case where uh, a, a reporter in Europe somewhere uh, pretended to be a representative of a foreign government interested in a technology that a, that a company was selling because he knew that that technology had... Uh, uh, was was being used elsewhere in the world to uh, to great harm, and, and so he pretended to be uh, interested in buying the technology, and he got as a result all of his information about the technology. Not clear that that was illegal, but where he was. But uh, then the question is, how to confirm that information? He's he's gotten it from the company, but some, you have to get comment if you're going to be, I think. A, a good journalist. I don't know what a good journalist is. You do a lot better than I. And then how, how do you go and confirm that with the company when you've tricked the company to give you that information? So th those are the types of questions that I think you need to think about ahead of time. And, and, and talk to uh, uh, your editor uh, who will probably you know, think, okay, fine. Uh, but then maybe also a lawyer uh, who will say, well, uh, let's, let's take a look at, and see exactly what you're doing uh, to, to get this and whether that's going to make the information somehow compromised. So what happened? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, I mean, and, and my advice in that case was very practical, which was don't have the journalist to assume the fake name. Go back to the source to confirm it. And surprise, I'm not, I'm not actually a sales representative or a representative of a foreign government. I'm a journalist. Now can you confirm that this is true information? That... that was not a good idea. And I thought even, even they should uh, consider not putting a byline on the story. Because, you know, that, that way, and there, it was more complicated because the journalist was in a different country from where the publisher is. And we wanted to avoid a lawsuit in the country where the journalist was. So better that the public not know where the journalist was. I just um, add a couple of practical uh, advices. Uh, if, you're, you, if you have confidential information on your data storage devices, on computers, your phone, your memory stick, uh, and you store it in your office or home, and uh, you have search in your house, let's say, uh, you, first, you can't prevent it. So if you are working with uh, serious topics, uh, you, you you have to uh, be prepared for that. So if police is searching your house, uh, first what you should really is, uh, do is uh, loudly say that you're a journalist and make sure that this is written in the protocol of the search. It's important because later on, you won't prevent them from taking all your data storage devices. They will take it anyway. They will take all your computers and your wife or husband computers and your mobile phones. They will take it anyway, and they will try to break through your passwords. So try to store as much as possible um, in clouds. So even if they will break through to your devices, they 
it's not necessarily that they would have access to your files. Well, try to think about these uh, um, uh, possibilities. Uh, but still, it, le legally speaking, it should be identified, written in the, in the legal p procedural papers of search that you're a journalist and you are announcing that you have confidential information related to your professional activity on all your storage devices. That will allow you later on to uh, challenge the search uh, in inter on international level. Let's say if you work in a European jurisdiction in the European Court of Human Rights, there are quite a number of cases which are protecting journalists from situations like that uh, because if you won't have a practical possibility to protect your confidential information and sources, that will not give you a possibility to perform your profession uh, as a you should. So uh, one of the cases is a Netherlands, ca Netherlands case, Sanoma, uh, publishing house Sanoma with givers versus Netherlands. Uh, all computers from the publishing house were seized by police in, uh, in the course of uh, investigation of a totally different case. Uh, then Nagla versus Latvia. Those two cases are really important uh, so you can have a look. And in uh, Sanoma it was a search in uh, office of publishing house and in Nagla it was a search in a house of a journalist. I, I just, okay. If I may just add one quick thing, that is uh, to be careful where you're going with the information. So uh, in your house, in your home, you're probably most protected. Uh, but if you're traveling across borders, you're totally unprotected. And, and, and you have to be aware of that. That in, in I think any, any place, the customs officers can just seize everything and, and check everything. Uh, and, and, and be aware of, of what other locations you might be in with the information and what protections you have there versus other locations. Okay, I'm gonna, we have to move on to the, the final, the final um, section about publishing because there's a lot to get through here. Um, so Galina, you were going to talk to us about the legal risks linked to content, um, but we're really going to have to keep to time on this one. So just a very quick overview. Just keeping it a third spot. Yeah, we're going to have to go straight on to that one. Um, so uh, when you're ready to publish your uh, text or uh, video, uh, make sure you understand all the legal risks and some practical advices uh, which probably would be just universal for any jurisdiction. Uh, journalists are not lawyers, that's clear. And not everyone who is actually working as a journalist uh, is, a tra is trained as a journalist in the university. And that means that uh, these people, even though they uh, work, perform the journalistic function, they not necessarily know anything about media law and legal risks, which is okay. Uh, journalistic profession is really um, uh, quite uh, general and it's not uh, requires to have a license or registration or uh, professional background uh, like ed by education. But still, uh, if you're working on a, a problematic issue, make sure you make sure you understand all legal risks and uh, have a media lawyer that you know that you can consult with. It's extremely important because uh, when you publish, when you release your publication, it might be already too late to ask a lawyer's advice. Uh, so publication, uh, uh, once it's released, uh, it doesn't really matter whether it's uh, published on in, in uh, registered media or online, or you just uh, publish it in your social media account. That's, legally speaking, is uh, public publicly disseminated uh, information and you could be held responsible for this. So in this case, uh, it would be great if you have a clearer understanding of uh, the whole range of legal risks and which legal risks are more important and more dangerous and which are, which are not that important and you just bear them in mind but don't uh, shiver of thinking about them. So uh, I would just list a number of risks and um, we will um, uh, contribute to uh, give you some advices on uh, some of them. So um, uh, first um, and probably the most um, um, oftenly um, coming to uh, uh, journalist, uh, journalistic work risk is a defamation. When you publish information, when you publish your um, article, uh, there are 
in many cases, uh, a person who you are criticizing, who is anti-hero of your publication, uh, this person brings a defamation claim. It could be civil defamation claim, it could be criminal defamation case, uh, if criminal defamation is still uh, not decriminalized in your uh, country. Uh, so defamation is something that like each journalist has to know, like his or her mother's name, like, and how to prevent a possibility to have that risk. So what you actually have to do, why you have to know about this, to change things in your publication prior, it, was, it will, would be disseminated. Like how you actually word your, this uh, phrase. Would you make it as a statement of fact, which you have to like 100% make sure that it's uh, true? Or if you don't have evidences of truthfulness of this information, change it into some other linguistic form like uh, question, uh, uh, perception, uh, opinion. So something that could not be checked uh, as a true fact. So uh, things like that. So you have to just understand how to uh, actually edit your text prior it would be published. So next, uh, and this is actually quite um, an often problem, like in Russia, we have up to like 5,000 uh, defamation, civil defamation cases a year, and half of them are uh, against journalists and bloggers and, uh, and human rights defenders actually, because they are publishing quite a lot of information uh, of that kind. Uh, so it's just um, quite healthy to understand how to avoid that because then you would be involved in like a long and uh, difficult pro criminal, like case uh, court process. Then infringement to privacy. Then that uh, is uh, not as often a uh, risk as a defamation, but still uh, it's also good to know what exactly could be considered as uh, infringement to privacy. Um, usually it's uh, about how much you know about this person and uh, you balance information about the personality you're writing about against the public interest. And you might know a lot about the person you're writing about, but it's not necessarily that you publish everything you know. So you take only those facts about his or her life that is really important to um, uh, go into and open the whole issue that you're writing, but not more than that. So, and this balance is really important, and uh, each, each uh, author of the publication, each journalist would really need to uh, tra train him or herself how to you know, find the, the line uh, which uh, you should not cross, not to be found uh, in violation of privacy. Then disclosure of confidential sources. This is an very difficult issue, to be honest, uh, because uh, in majority of jurisdictions there is no one uh, law written document which would have the list of all confidential information. Like, don't do this, this and that, this information is secret, this information is, confiden uh, information is confidential. Usually it's one or two provisions in, in hundreds of different uh, uh, regulations. Uh, but that is also quite healthy to know because uh, you are working with information. And of course, you might uh, uh, bump into information which is really important and interesting, but that could be like a state secret. Or it could be like uh, some other confidential information like, uh, for instance, in many jurisdictions, you cannot uh, disclose information about adopted child identity about just the fact that he was he or she was, was adopted. And even though if this person, if this child is your neighbor's adopted child and you knew for your whole life, whole life that your neighbors didn't have children and all of a sudden they just got a 10 year old boy and it's clear that they adopted him. So even in this case, you cannot disclose that. And that's like a criminal liability for, for doing that. So it's, it, it would be great to know all that. And uh, then... Five minutes left, so I'm gonna... Okay, um, uh, just uh, last two uh, risks. Restrictions, thematic restrictions. Uh, governments like to restrict uh, journalists to publish on certain issues. So identify those issues in your, your jurisdictions not to put yourself and your publisher under risk. And illustrations. 
if you use photos or videos to illustrate your publication, make sure you do not violate copyright and image right of a person who is seen on, on that image. So, so this is clear that that might uh, bring another risks while you're publishing your material. Okay, great. Um, the final slide we had, um, Emmanuel was going to talk to the legal risks that you might face that are not related to your um, publication. But I'm going to ask if Emmanuel's all right if we leave the slide up there, um, because I really did want to um, have at least some time for questions in case people had uh, something that wasn't clear or if there were issues that you wanted to raise. There are two drop-in legal clinics tomorrow and on Saturday which are entirely audience-led and so will be a time to discuss specific cases that you might have. Um, but if there was anything about the presentation or specific questions you had, then please do say. And I'm going to get the microphone to you because we're being recorded. Well, two questions. One for you, one for you. Uh, the first one was, again, just to same thing I asked you the last time around. When the Facebook copyright issue came up and uh, the person wanted to prohibit the publication based on copyright infringement and probably wrote to the hosting website to, in, you know, to, push, to p pull your stuff down, what happened in that case? I, I uh, spoke to the uh, company uh, hosting uh, the website and said that uh, I understood that the use of the image was, as we call it in the U.S., fair use, uh, enabling the use of copyrighted material uh, for a specific purpose or uh, in a shortened form, and uh, convinced the web hoster to not to take down the image. Okay, and that was successful? Yeah, and, and the person who was the subject of the story didn't pursue it any further. Uh, the story was so bad, I think he wanted to forget all about it. And <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. You raised the issue of whistleblower protection. Yes. Jamaica has a whistleblower protection legislation. Yes. However, it doesn't protect the whistleblower if the whistleblower speaks to journalists. All the legislation that you're speaking about right now in Europe and what's to come, do they explicitly say that revealing to a journalist is protected? That's my understanding. Um, those are the rules that they are insisting on because they want to have that connection. That that's why they specifically inserted a uh, journalist. Now, how that plays out, um, we're, we'll have to wait and see because it's now um, we're looking for individual countries to implement these particular rules. Um, so hopefully th that has informed this. But Jamaica is an example of um, a number of countries that have whistleblower protection, but they don't have it in the real sense of where they're um, giving it to journalists. Um, on the flip side, however, um, there is good news in terms of um, journalist protection of sources. More than 100 countries, and I think Jamaica uh, as well, um, have uh, laws um, that protect journalists. And in addition to those cases that were in the European Court of Human Rights, um, in the East African Court of Justice a couple of years ago, journalists could not be compelled to turn over information, and even though this related to national security. So there, that is one of the good news stories for journalists around the world, is that there's more uniformity in protection. But Doreen, in, in the United States, the federal whistleblower protection does not extend to giving documents to journalists. Yes, I know that. Is that? I know that, yeah. So in the U.S., under federal law, you're not protected as a whistleblower if you give the, the information to a journalist. Yep. Yes. Yes, very much so. And, and in fact, that has been um, the prosecutions that have occurred under Obama and now under the Trump administration against not the journalists, because they have not been successful so far against journalists, although they've attempted to get them to reavail. But there's been eight or nine uh, um, convictions uh, for whistleblowers. You, you can see that in this case that we're reading about every day now. The whistleblower didn't go to a journalist but went to the Inspector General of the Director yes. of National Intelligence, and that was following the whistleblower law. Yep. Uh, and, and that's why we still don't know what the information is. We may, may not. So it's okay to, well, is it something then that you would advise as a lawyer for us to go to the legislature and say, a whistleblower comes to us, we should tell the whistleblower to go and report it somewhere first and then tell us the story so that they're protected? You no, know, that, that still wouldn't be protected. I mean, it, it could be follow the procedures and report it to the government, fine, protected. Talk to you beforehand, afterwards, not protected.
Right. So even though it's out there already, if you still have the relationship with the journalist as a whistleblower, it's not protected. We have seen in Germany examples where multinational companies who don't like questions publish the question of the journalist and the answer so that they kind of steal the story before the journalist can publish it. And I was wondering if the journalist could sue the company for an IP infringement on publishing the questions. There's no copyright protection for that. Um, so it's in terms of a question or idea or a concept. Um, so I don't see that. I mean, w w the whistleblower case shows a, a broader problem for journalists, and that is with confidential sources. So a source who isn't a whistleblower, isn't revealing government secrets, but just wants to be anonymous. Uh, you, you have a similar conflict with that source as you do with the whistleblower. You, you know, you should, if, if you want to get the, st the story, you don't tell a whistleblower, don't tell me, because you might go to jail. Right? A lawyer would tell the, the, the whistleblower that, don't talk to the journalist, but the journalist wants, wants the information. Confidential source is somewhat the same thing, because when the journalist gets sued for defamation uh, and needs to defend herself with a truth defense, may be in a position of having to call upon the confidential source to confirm that the story was true. So when you're publishing something based on confidential sources and you're sure that it's true, you still have to worry uh, whether you might be forced to reveal the identity of your confidential source just to clear yourself of the defamation action. So you're in attention with your sources that way. But the Reynolds case, um, which I didn't get a chance to talk about, um, kind of shifted the discussion on that and the protection. So that was a case in which um, uh, a, a Times newspaper um, uh, was sued by an I Irish um, politician for um, saying that he lied to the Irish parliament. And so in 2000, the UK House of Lords ruled that, okay, you can't prove the truth or falsity of it, but if something is defamatory, and defamatory is defined, I like to call it the three I's, if you say someone is doing something illegal, immoral, or they're incompetent, then bells should be going off in your head because those are traditionally the um, underlying principles behind uh, uh, lowering someone's reputation. Um, and so the case um, went out and the court came up with these 10 factors that said, okay, if it's in the public interest, and it's a product of responsible journalism, it's okay, There's, that's a proper defense. Um, and then in 2006, the House of Lords um, also, this is the predecessor to the UK uh, Supreme Court, which came into effect in 2009, said, okay, these are the things you need to do. So as journalists and international media companies have looked at and said, look, there are certain standards that have been laid out by the courts, and these are good practices. One, is there public interest in the story? Uh, two, what's the tone of the article? Is it neutral or is it attacking someone? What are the credibility of the sources and the extent of the verification? These are all factors that look into it. How urgent is the story? Could it wait or not wait? And then finally, do you have the target's versions of events in that story? Did you try to contact them for information? Do you have the gist of that? If you can tick those boxes off, those are pretty good bullet protections uh, for facing a lot of defamation cases um, that can protect you as you move forward. Okay, I think we are out of time, so I'm going to thank my panel um, and also let you know that the presentation will be on the conference app, but we'll also put links to all of the cases that were talked about. So if there are um, issues that you want more information about, then please do have a look. They're a really good way of understanding how um, those kind of issues are being considered by the courts and where your, your main considerations would be. Um, and please do familiarize, familiarize yourself with the legislation in your own country. Thank and you. Come tomorrow. Yeah, and come to the drop-in session tomorrow to discuss your specific cases. Yeah, <laughs> none of this. We is haven't given you any legal advice here. We just want you to know. <laughs> yeah. Thank Otherwise, you. we'll be responsible. Don't sue us.